guess that makes me David Dimbleby. Hello and welcome everyone. It's lovely to see you all here. I hope you've had a good day, really productive day so far. And um, this is just going to be fascinating because you've got some amazingly influential and important people here and you can pick their brains and hopefully learn something from what we're going to do in the next hour. Um, I'm Joe Wiley. Um, I think we'll let everybody do their own introductions so you know exactly who is doing what and what their names are. We'll start off at this side here with Nick. My name's Nick Raphael. I'm the managing director of Epic Records. OK, and sorry, when you do your introductions, you have to tell me the first gig that you went to see. First gig <laughs> I ever went to see at Stranglers at Brixton Academy. OK, he's gone for the cool option. No, I'm, I'm not cool, by the way, but that was the first gig. OK, impressive. <laughs> Uh, my name's Mike Smith. I'm the managing director of Columbia Records. And my first gig, I can't remember what it was, but it was Spears, uh, Spears Atletico 80. I think they were there. Oh, Spears Energy. It was Spears Energy, and it was at Eric's in Liverpool. Okay. My name's Georgia Gatidis. I'm the head of music of Radio 1 and Radio 1 Extra. And the first gig that I ever went to was the Jam in Leeds in 1978, I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, I saw The Clash at Birmingham Bingley Hall. That was my Ooh, first flash. credible band that I'm going to admit to here because I'm not going to say who else I saw. Uh, this is Russell. Uh, I'm Russell Warby and I'm an agent at William Morris Endeavour. And uh, the first gig that I went to see would have been my dad playing bass somewhere. Ah. And uh, yeah, he wasn't famous. And he was one of those people that turned themselves a semi-professional musician back in those days. <laughs> but, but I was going to see him before I even knew I was going to see him. So it's very good. And Martin. Hi, I'm Martin Mills. I run the Vegas Group of Independent Labels. That's Rough Trade, Matador, Exile, and Foydy. Wow. And uh, my first gig was Pink Floyd at the Carfax Assembly Rooms in Oxford, playing to 200 people. Whoa. 200 people. Okay. <laughs> and finally, Jeff. Yeah, I'm uh, Jeff Ellis from uh, DF Concerts. We're concert promoters. We do the Tea in the Park Music Festival and gigs all over Scotland with acts from club to, to stadium level. My first gig was in Manchester, Apollo, and it's Rainbow, so not as cool as a class <laughs> or the jam <laughs> or Pink Floyd, but it's uh, yeah, Rainbow with uh, Richard Blackmore. You should so have a radio show. Have you done radio? Your voice is just <laughs> extraordinary. <laughs> People have got a face for radio, so... Yeah, likewise. <laughs> OK, so this is the um, BBC Introducing Musicians Masterclass, and we are live from Studio One Abbey Road, which is a very historical and special place, I'm sure you'll agree. In the next hour, we'll be putting some questions to our panel who are here. Um, I'll be putting your questions. I know you've submitted questions, and I'll put those questions. Uh, we've also got Bobby Friction. Where are you, Bobby? OK, look at that man over there. That is Bobby Friction. Uh, and he's going to be running around getting the microphone to people. We'll take some of the questions from you on the floor as well. And also, people are tweeting at the moment, so we'll take your tweets. And we'll, again, we'll just kind of address them to the panel. Um, the first one that comes from Michael Jefferson. Michael, are you here? Just out of interest. Hello, Michael. I'll read it out if that's OK. So Michael's question is, there are a few bands that are doing everything themselves and have been quite successful. Do you believe this is the way forward, or do you think record labels still play an important part in the music industry? Mike, we'll go to you, first of all, with this one. Um, it's funny, we were just talking before we came down about Woo Life, who are a band who are determined not to put their music out through a record label, but they have done a, a major publishing deal to support themselves and finance themselves. And I'd love to see more artists doing that, even though I work at a major label. I think it's fantastic when artists are going out there and are trying to do it themselves as much as possible. And I get a little bit frustrated that with everybody banging on about how you can do things yourselves and how you can break through on the internet or through social networking, no one really has done it, or hardly anybody has done it to any real extent. And I absolutely believe that major labels are still the most effective way of breaking an artist through to a mainstream audience and to a global audience. But I think the more people can find other avenues to get their music through, the better. I think it's healthy competition for what we're doing at the majors. And I think, I hope majors going forward and in the future can work much more in partnership with sort of like independents and with artists who are doing it for themselves as they want to try and get bigger distributions, they want to try and reach more people. They can actually partner up with a major label to do it. So I think it's a very good thing. But I certainly don't think it makes what we do redundant. OK, so the bottom line, the benefit of being on a record label, what is it that you offer to a band? The Resources. I, it's, it's expertise in terms of the people that work in the label, people who know everything there is to know about marketing, about promotion, about press, about A&R, about how you actually make the records. And it's money. 
you know, if you're, if you're going to reach as many people as possible, yes, you can achieve an enormous amount for free. Um, you know, if you're fabulously talented, that will take your message faster than any clever marketing message. But most people, if they're lucky, have got a reasonable amount of talent. If they're smart, there's a lot of hard work. And if there's money behind it, that just amplifies everything enormously. So I think hopefully we bring the knowledge the, the marketing and the promotions and the press base and the A&R base has, but we give it the money to back it up with that can take it to as many people as possible. But money is no solution, for ta is no alternative to talent. You've got to have the talent there. Okay. But the more talent you've got, the less money you need. Okay. Uh, Martin, can I just ask what you think about that? Um, I, I'd agree with all of that, and I think the answer to the question is yes in both cases. I think the difference probably with labels like mine is that another thing that we offer to artists is perception and positioning. And if an artist signs to an XL or a rough trade, that says something about who they are and it allows the media to perceive them in a certain way and their peers to perceive them in a certain way. So I think that's an extra benefit. But to me, I mean, the more people like Woo Life do what they're doing, more power to their elbow. I think that the, better, the more that happens, the better the music economy is. Okay, uh, this question is kind of related. Uh, it's from Zoe Kones, I think it is. Um, would you recommend a motivated artist start their own record label, and why? Why should they do that? Um, who wants to go for that one? Nick? I would re I'd recommend any artist to, to do it themselves for as long as they possibly can, and to, to have as little external influence as they can, if they are capable and if they have the talent to do so. One of the artists I got involved with in 1996 was Jay-Z. He'd been dropped by a major record label. He was doing it on his own, out of his kitchen, with his then manager and partner, and a lady who was a live agent. And they did it out of the kitchen. He put out Reasonable Doubt himself. The record then ended up selling half a million copies in 13 weeks. And at that point, he was willing to license for America and for the rest of the world. I was fortunate to get the license for everywhere outside of America. Unfortunately, my American company weren't interested. And he did it all himself. Today, his success as, as a entrepreneur, as a musician, everything, I think the grounding came from learning himself, doing it himself. When you look at artists like David Gray, who we looked at when, when he was available, when he put the record out himself in Ireland and the UK, but I think what the advantage those artists get is they understand what the process is and they understand what you can bring to the party. And I think it's only a good thing that they learn that process so they know that there is something that the record company does. They do help the process. And I think sometimes artists come in and they're successful, very, very few, but are fortunate from the door on the record label, and then they wonder what the record label actually did. And I think there is a very important infrastructure and there is a very important financial model. And I think the reality is more artists doing it for themselves is a good thing, and then partner with a record label or sign to a record label when the moment is right. And the worst thing in the world is an artist that comes in, had no idea, doesn't seem to have the motivation, and says to you, yeah, what do you think of that? My mate got a record deal, why sh you should give me a record deal. That's the wrong attitude, and I think the more people who do it for themselves, the better it is. But you hear that quite often, do you? Oh, you get stupid, you get literally stupid emails that you think, this is ridiculous. On what basis should, should we take you seriously? You send a note and go, uh, check this out, uh, please give me an email back, and you look, you look at the whole thing and it's presented terribly, the music is terrible, there's no thought gone into it. And you send an email back and say, how are you playing gigs? What are you, what are you doing? Where's your, look, I looked you up, can't find any of your music on YouTube. I can't find your music in any of the, I've Googled you, I've done this, that and the other. And you find nothing about the person. You think, well, you presented yourself so badly. You have nothing that's professional about you. Yes, you've, you've written a little ditty on your guitar with your friends and you've recorded it in your bedroom. So from that, sometimes you find a minor acorn. But the reality is they've not done enough to, to take the next step forward. It doesn't mean they haven't got the talent one day to be the biggest artist in the world, but you need to do something. You need, you know, you need to sell yourself and inspire people to have belief in you, I guess. Yeah. If you can't do anything, you know, if some, I've won some, another executive once said to me, who is a mentor of mine, if you have more ambition than the artist, it will never work. And the truth of the matter is, you know, the most driven artists, most successful artists I've ever worked with, have been more driven about their career than I ever could. And as George knows, who's seen me many times, be very enthusiastic about my artists. It's pretty hard to be more enthusiastic about the artists outside of mine. <laughs> and you know, if they're not, then that's a problem. And I think sometimes artists say, well, I'm an artist, I recorded the record, it's your job to sell it. No, it's not. It's our job to help you sell it. 
Okay, Bobby, um, you, I mean, you're an artist. You, you've kind of been out there doing it yourself. How do you suggest a new artist goes about getting oh, into the well, business? Well, I was actually going to ask that question for these learned men on, on the panel. <laughs> I'll come back to my answer in a minute. Does anyone have a blueprint for going about setting up your own label and for doing it yourself? Um, I know there may not be a perfect blueprint, but there's a lot of people here who may not even have an idea for how to do that. So what's the best way to go about it? Go on, Martin. I'd say the best way is to join AIM, the Association of Independent Music, which is a trade association of independent labels, which will do exactly that. Yeah. What's that? Well, I have a little record label, a, a, a little minnow compared to these guys in terms of what a, the rest of what I do. But, I mean, the fact, of the, the fact of it, most of these things, whether it's starting a label, starting a band, anything is to have, I think, ability and knowledge will come. Obviously, that kernel of inspiration and talent is going to be the first is, is the ult ultimately the fundamental thing that you really need. But, you know, read up, learn about how it's done, look at who the, who, what your peers are doing, the precedents set by people that you admire within the industry. I mean, for me, you know, looking back, less so on agents historically, but looking back at, you know, the classic labels, going back and looking to Motown, looking to Atlantic, looking to Columbia, all the people that actually started originally as independent organisations, and they all started more or less out of someone's kitchen or someone's living room or, you know, you know in their parents' house. Nearly all of those things, they all started that way. But do you guys a... think that musicians make good businessmen? No. I yeah. think that, that's, a key, that's, so, a key, that's a key point. I'm not going to... My mic's not saying, but that's a key point. Just because you know how to play an instrument, doesn't mean you know how to sell the music that instrument makes. But I think the, the enthusiasm and the drive and the energy you can bring to starting up a label is, you know, that, that can take you a reasonable amount of the way. Setting up an indie label doesn't mean that you're going to suddenly be challenging XL or Columbia or Epic. And it shouldn't be about that. It should be fun. And one of the most things that frustrates me most about the music business is the fact that so many people, as soon as they pick up a guitar, immediately want to get a record deal, immediately want to be famous and sell millions of records. And it's just that they lose the actual joy of, of what they're doing. And it's a bit like that, you know, start a record label and enjoy it. It's a, it's a, it is actually a fun thing to do. Don't get too caught up in trying to be a huge, a huge organization. Just actually enjoy the process and learn from it and talk to people and use it as an opportunity to meet people and learn about it. And you know, you look at somebody like Alan McGee, who's arguably one of the most successful independent labels going through the 1990s. I don't think he would ever put his hand up and say he was a brilliant businessman, but he had a phenomenal eye for talent. And it was that phenomenal eye for talent that kept the business going, going forward. I don't profess myself to be a, a, a genius businessman at all, but luckily I'm surrounded by people that are very efficient businessmen and very, very, very clever people that, that know how to put the combination of the things that I do well into a business format. And I think the most important thing, I mean, it, it, for an artist, it, that ambition that Nick was talking about, that's actually every bit as important as the talent. The one, the one, the one, we'll jump in. It's qualities that you need of, you know, drive, commitment, passion, you know, and, and combining that with, with talent, it's not necessarily business skills because our artists should be artists and not, necessarily need to, to, to be good at business. But without, the, as the guys were saying, without the commitment and passion and energy and drive, you know, the, the, the talent alone, you know, isn't gonna get there unless somebody un, you know, overturns the stone. So you've gotta have those qualities more than business skills. I was just gonna say that, you know, it's, uh, I barely know anyone, and I'm sure that everyone would agree with this here, who, for whom uh, overnight success has ever actually been a particularly good thing. You know, there's, for everyone, whether we're talking about Alan McGee and whether we're talking about different musicians, it's been a long, hard struggle. And quite often being given exactly what you thought you wanted immediately can turn out to be totally disastrous. The, the, you know, the, the history of music is littered with like, artists that got massive record deals and were never able to perform again. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's... Uh, you have to be prepared for the fact that this is really a marathon. It's not a sprint. You know, this is not about passing the audition on the talent program. This is about like, you know, putting your whole heart and soul into what you know you want to be your life and your career. So. Okay.
And even when you have the most established bands and artists, I'm sure you're all aware of this, whether it's your Coldplay's or your Gary Barlow's or your Brandon Flowers, they are so driven now and they're so competitive when they're kind of putting their records out. They're kind of studying each other's careers all the time, just trying to be that one step ahead. So it's kind of, it's got to be there. The hunger's got to be there all the time. Yeah. Um, right, another question. Uh, this is from Ollie, Ollie Greenster. Ollie, you here? Hey, Ollie. Hi. Uh, this is probably for you, George. Um, I've enjoyed the refreshing variety of new and under the radar music that's been played on Radio 1 in the past month. I feel it's making Radio 1 look more accessible to up and coming musicians like ourselves here today in this room. Um, it's a great thing. Will this be continuing from now on? Obviously, I don't know if you're referring to that first week in January where we did the special. Yeah, specifically. Um, I mean, obviously, that was, uh, you know, a, from our point of view, a really exciting, bold kind of innovation for us. It's something we're certainly thinking about repeating next year. It's not something we'll do on a regular basis, but the key thing about Radio 1 is obviously that we carry every day, all week, all year, huge amounts of specialist programming anyway, and it was really to flag that up in, a, in a, just a slightly more bold way. Because I mean, I'm sure all of you know here, the, you know, all of our specialist output, or at least some of our specialist output, and the huge range of new music that goes through that. And then, of course, as you know, again, hopefully on the playlist every week now, we're committing to a, an act that's come through BBC Introducing. So in terms of exposure or something or an act at the very, very early stages of their career, there's a new opportunity there. And then, frankly, I mean, every week now we're trying to go for, you know, some bold moves. People that are doing interesting, innovative music from a whole wide range of genres um, so I'd argue strongly you know that that is something that we consistently do really okay um, so the playlist thing will continue throughout throughout the year that's a, uh, the a playlist commitment. is permanent in terms of an introducing act on every week yeah um, we'll have some questions from the floor so for people who haven't submitted questions already uh, is there anyone that wants to ask anything okay let's get Bobby this lady here would like to ask a question please <coughs> Um, is the uh, day of, uh, where a record label um, develops an artist, is that day, uh, has it died? Um, and when you're looking to sign an artist, are you seeking for the ready-made product or are you still able to see the, um, the potential in a blank canvas? I, so okay, I, Nick. I, I'll, I'll start, sorry. I, I do both. I'm happy to take artists from TV shows and have done. And I'm happy to, um, we're happy to take artists like we did Paloma Faith and she, we thought she was amazing, she was on the live circuit, every other record label had looked at her, some of them made offers and passed, and six months afterwards we sat down with her and tried to work out the reasons she hadn't succeeded, and then we spent an 18 month process of doing the A&R development with her. Weirdly, unlike a lot of other artists, she'd spent so much time on the, uh, doing London club circuit, had her own club, doing all that sort of thing. Her live stuff was way ahead, and her, but her recording stuff was way behind. Um, but with the resources we had and the skills we had, we were able to facilitate her making the records she needed to make. And I think no, from my opinion, and I'm sure, Mike, I'm sure Martin may have different views, but there is no one way of doing anything. If, you, if the Arctic Monkeys walk in with the album more or less written and ready to go and all it needs is mixing, ready to go, every record company in, in the world would bite their arm off. But if somebody is talented as an Adele, take one of Martin's artists, walks in the room and you've got to start the A&R process from, from scratch, you'd happily do that as well. I don't, think, I don't think, for me, personally, I can definitely say, I, I don't care. As long as someone's got talent, as long as someone's got a likability factor, as long as someone has got something that we believe we can sell and, and can, a potential to make a record that, that could be a classic, they're the three things I think about. But that window is smaller now, isn't it? It's much smaller because there, is, you know, there isn't very much money around all the labels. So an artist has to sell. They have to prove themselves within, what, the first album? I, 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 dis I, disagree, I disagree on two things. Because you know what? It, that's true if you sign an artist for £250,000 plus cost. If you sign an artist for a sensible amount of money and make a record for a sensible amount of money, which I'm sure Martin's done for years and developed artists for years, right? you can do that and they can sell a, a sensible number of records which break even, make enough to get into the next record. If you go out there and you expect Rolls Royce treatment and business class flights, and on your first album you don't sell a million copies, expect to get dropped. If you go out there because you love being an artist and you don't mind getting in the back of a van with your mates and your dad or your uncle or your other mate driving the van, you, can have, you will be given more time. 
Yeah, but, but and also one album, two albums, three albums. Well, some artists, you know, listen, look at Plan B. He was on the major, right? And the first album uh, for uh, Ben Wet sold about 120,000 copies. Second album comes, he ch slightly changes his style, and that album's now open, it's going to get to a million copies in the UK. So that can happen on the major. But you know, if you most of the people come to major are, lo are looking for instant success. That's the problem. You know, if there are many, as Martin will tell you, and he, he brings up the independent. Label session. There's hundreds and hundreds of labels of people that would happily have an artist that sells five to ten thousand copies. He said the problem is people want to go up and they want to play for the top four clubs in the Premiership, right, on the first day that they've ever kicked a football. But you've got to go out and do your grassroots stuff. You've got to go out and earn your spurs. You know, uh, what's it, uh, Snow Patrol? That's the fourth album, isn't it, that broke through? They were on Jeepster before that, and that they're was not quite the only a long time one. ago, wasn't it? Yeah. Martin, what would you say? I, I guess for us, a band like the XX is like the classic example where we never mould artists. We, we so Sony have skills at moulding and packaging. Packaging, if you like, artists. We don't do that. We're not good at it. We don't try and do it. We try and find artists that got a very strong sense of what they want to be, and they just want help, support, assistance, guidance, information. And with a band like the XX, who was signed to a very modest deal, there were no pressures. It grew very gradually. It came out relatively quietly and grew to the point where they've sold like a million albums worldwide after a year and a half. That, to me, is the classic way that we work well. With the likes of Adele, which is the other end, the other opposite of the extreme, we probably A&R her more actively than almost anyone else on the roster. So that's as active as we get in terms of shaping. But she knows what she's doing. She's in charge. We're only helping. OK. Is that OK? Yeah, Happy with your answer? You. Uh, any more questions? Sorry, just because my eye was down there. We'll give you a go, the, the guy with the hat, and then we'll... Do some more in a minute. Um, yeah, it sort of leads on uh, from that. But also what you were saying before about getting an email from, you know, an unimpressive email, basically. Um, hypothetically, if I feel that I've got something that would make you go, OK, these guys aren't messing about, um, how would I go about getting that to people such as yourselves in, you know, in charge of labels and also um, people who are in, in charge of getting maybe national radio play? Are you, are you as easy to contact as I, 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 somebody I, might hope? Realistically, if you send an email to the person that runs the company, they, you're less likely to get, you know, some people send an email and expect, you know, the chairman of Sony or Universal or Warners or Martin to, to answer them back. That's unrealistic. Yeah. It, there are people employed, and they're clearly employed as, as scouts, as junior A&R people, whose job is to respond to people like you all the time. It's to listen to those nuggets that may be an acorn that we should develop or talk to you and do, walk you through the process before you're ready to sign or give you some good advice or introduce you to a manager or introduce you to someone to get a live date or something like that. I think what's unrealistic and I find very frustrating is, you know, I sometimes have someone's mum send me their daughter doing a cover version and say to me, oh, check this out, she's as good as Whitney Houston. And it's like, obviously not true. But if you, send an, if you send something to a junior, junior A&R person or a scout, it's their job to respond to you. It, but I think some people are unrealistic at where they're trying to enter the organisation. Yeah. And and what about the A&R department? So are they still, do they do still exist? Are there many people working in A&R yeah, at the moment? Yes. Is it kind of a healthy... Absolutely, and they're, they're still a reasonable size. I mean, we've, we've got two scouts that work in our team that are actively scouring both the country and the internet all the time. I think it's, it's never been more straightforward in a way to, to approach companies in that you know, we're very easy to find out what our email addresses are and to actually dive in and get a hold of people. I, you know, I've, I've always felt you know, if, 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 if there's, it's a very tough world breaking through in the music business. And if an artist hasn't managed to work out how to come to the attention of a scout, I'm slightly dubious about whether they've got what it takes to go all the way in the music industry. You know, or, you know they, they, it's all about finding somebody that can grab my attention. And that's obviously the first group of people you want to go to is the talent scouts. And in terms of how do I reach the talent scouts, you ring up the, the label, you can get through to the A&R department. The A&R assistants or secretaries will tell you who the people are to approach. And people will respond to mail. But it, the, the most effective way is to actually tell somebody to tell the scouts. Because if, if, if a promoter at a club or somebody in a rehearsal studio or a journalist says, I've heard this, it's brilliant, that's going to be a much more impressive than you speaking to the scouts going, hey, I'm brilliant. And I go, yeah, I'm sure you are. But if somebody that they trust says that you're really good, then you're up and running. You know, anybody that I respect in the music industry who says, I've heard this, it's great, I'll immediately check it out. 
Whereas if somebody sends me an email through the post and I don't know who it's from, I'll pass it straight onto one of our scouts and so they tell me if this is any good or not. Okay, we've got some uh, questions coming through on Twitter. If you do want to tweet us, then you can do that by uh, going to hashtag BBC Intro MC. Bobby, you've got some questions? Okay, uh, this question on Twitter is from uh, Humanizer. How do you grow a fan base when attracting audiences for unsigned bands is declining? Who would like to pick that one up? I th I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on this. Uh, you know, it is, it's, it's very difficult because to, to build up a, an audience, you've got to you know, go out and get gigs. And getting gigs before anybody's known of you, no, no, known about you, you know, is hard. So it's, you know, it's a bit of a chicken and egg sit situation. But, yeah, and this is where, you know, BBC introducing things like that come in. You know, that, that is an opportunity to go into BBC introducing, upload your material and then get seen on a festival lineup. You know, the, fest the, the, the audience are coming because of the festival, because of all the headliners, and then there's a stage where people go and, and, and check things out. At, at Seeing the Park, we've got a, two new band stages, a BBC Introducing, plus we've got a tea break stage, which is local Scottish acts. So if you're lucky enough to get through those kind of channels, then you are going to get seen by a, a bigger audience. But other than that, it's, it's kind of working in your local area as well, you know, if you're from Manchester, getting gigs in, in the Manchester area, getting people along to see you and building up a bit of a vibe. And if you're good, people will start talking about you, as, as you, know, you were saying there. You know, if, if a promoter or, you know, a, a club booker in Manchester says to his mate in Portsmouth, oh, there's this really good, Ma you know, Manchester band should pick up on him, then, you know, they might start to look out for, for, for shows. But, it, it, you know, it's perseverance and it's, and it's hard, but... You've got to get out there playing live. And, you know, the Beatles you know, famously went out to Hamburg and did a load of shows in, in strip bars where they, they honed their, their, their craft and, and, and you know, built up you know, uh, their, their abilities and did the kind of, you know, the 10,000 hours of, of you know, uh, you know uh, is a philosophy of, of greatness. You've got to do 10,000 hours of something before you earn your spurs. But, it, you know, it's, it's not easy. There's no, in, you know, you were saying before about blueprints. There is no you know, one blueprint. Otherwise, everybody with talent would be huge, and, and that doesn't happen. So it's just working hard. But it's taking the opportunities when they come along and making sure, you know, if somebody says, oh, I really like you, then it's like, well, you know, use their name and, you know, put it to, a, you know, a, a booker or a promoter somewhere else and say, you know, Russell Warby saw me at a gig. He said he thought I was really good. Well, you know, tell every you know book in the country that Russell thought you were good when he, he saw your gig. You know. So, people... so if people want to get on the bill, say for tea in the park or for the BBC introducing stages. Practically, what do they do? Well, the be best thing is, you know, in that case, is to upload your, your material onto BBC introducing you know, on, 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 onto the website. If you're, you know, based in Scotland. And you know, there's another opportunity with the tea break stage where you know we we launch at the the end of February. Again, we ask bands to you know send in their you know links to their their, their sites or the YouTube clips or you know the CDs, whatever you know format you know they, they want to give it to us in. And you know we we whittle it down with a, an industry kind of short you know an industry panel to get a short list of bands, and then those bands get to get to play live. So you know we probably get a thousand. You know, applicants for tea break, of which we, we probably pick 30 bands, but you know, it's still an opportunity for, for those 30. And, and other festivals support new, new bands as well. Do, do okay, you think the about... panel actually sometimes, uh, do you think you guys think that new bands are focusing maybe too much on Twitter and MySpace and Facebook and SoundCloud and not getting out there and playing live enough? I think it's a, it's a valuable tool. I mean, it's, just, it's really just another way of announcing your presence because, I mean, you know, the whole, the whole growth of the internet in that respect, you know, tweeting and Facebook and every other way of like letting people know that you existed, it's just a new form. I mean, people have been doing it, whether it was like you discovered new music through your local record shop, whether you read it through, you know, the papers, whether it was just because you knew the people in the local clubs, it's just that new way of doing it. I mean, on the assumption when we're talking about people sort of developing fan bases, there's, there's a myriad ways to do that. Obviously, tweeting's useful, but I mean, you know, saying you know you are a you know you're the, the local great band and you've managed to develop an audience of your of uh, you know of your friends and some of your peers locally, etc. I mean, these are just fabulous tools to be able to mobilise your local fan base and say, well, we come from Reading, but we look, took everyone to Oxford and then we took everyone to London. You know, and one thing that British bands have been particularly good at doing, and this goes from like Stone Roses and 
and the Arctic Monkeys did it, and I think it wasn't really organised then by them, but it happened with the Libertines, was people like following them around the country, you know, and, and I, I really remember this very, very strongly, like sort of tracking the Arctic Monkeys, and like they'd come out of Sheffield, and then suddenly somebody says, yeah, there was 200 people to see them in Manchester, I can't believe it. They all came from Sheffield, but it didn't matter, you know. So it's, uh, you know, you develop your fans, give them enough, you know, give them something to keep them on the hook and take them with you. And that's the way you grow it. Someone wants to know about agents. Andy Shields. Is Andy in here? Hey, Andy. Um, his question is, what advice can you offer about agents? As an unsigned artist or a band, in my experience, agents tend to only promote bands with record contracts, which makes it difficult to get the big gigs. Um, do agents work with unsigned bands despite the lack of revenue? Um, yeah, I mean, some agents are, you know, some agents will sign artists because they can see uh, immediate dollars. And I mean, I think they have said in the agency world that there's no mission like commission. So, uh, but I take on new bands all the time. You know, I took on a band just before Christmas, a group called Two Wounded Birds. They put out a, you know, an EP via a friend's label. They haven't done a deal yet. We're already booking, booking shows. I'm confident that they will get a deal that suits them at some point, you know. I've worked down the, years and, down the years, and maybe I'm a bit of an anomaly, but I think there are other agents, certainly, who are interested in getting involved with new music. No manager, no label. Just, you know, people that you meet who have great belief in what they do and obvious talent, you know, and that's, that's the two essential requirements. How many bands do you have? How many acts do you look after? About 50. 50? 50? Okay. I think so, yeah. <laughs> and are there a lot of agents around? What's, how many would you say? Um, like key players? And what, in sort of terms that? of the companies? Um, yeah. Well, the, you know, there are, there are... I mean, you can find something that suits your needs very well. I mean, there are the major agencies. You know, there's... Um, um, you know, WME and CAA and the agency group, and you've got primary and all of those, and then you've got the boutique agencies who maybe have some big artists, and who, but, you know, there are specific people that really are, you know, companies like Elastic that are really just looking to, to you know, to push through new artists. I mean, clearly, obviously, they're looking for those opportunities to grow themselves, you know, so, you know, so if you're, you know, if you've got the talent and the enthusiasm, go and beat on a few doors, you know. So what should people be doing? Is it kind of emailing and uploading? Yeah, I, I mean, I must. I, I do listen to everything. I mean, that's terrible. I mean, it drives me. It drives me mad, really. But I do listen to everything, and I realise certain things are not appropriate to me. You know, it's just like, oh, I don't know. Is this a good or a bad dubstep record? I don't know. So do but you push them on to other agents? To, if I, yeah, if I think you know that's appropriate, then yes, you know. Okay. Jeff, and, uh, yeah, it's it's like with managers as well. It's you know, there's good managers out there. There's good agents, but it might not always be the best agent, you know, for, for your particular act. As, as Russell says, you know, it might be a, a genre of music that agent doesn't know particularly well. So you can't just badger every single agent and expect, every, you know, every agent to want to, to do you. And you can make the wrong decision. You can work for an agent who overbooks you and, you know, doesn't think about career progression. I mean, Russell's worked with, you know, bands like Strokes, White Stripes, Foo Fighters. He's worked with them for a long time and built them up from club level to you know the level that they are now, and it represents them all worldwide out, outside of America generally, don't you? Mm -hmm. So, you know, and you know, choosing a, you know a, an agent you want somebody who's got the, the the passion can see the career development because you don't want to be changing agent you know every every five minutes. So, and I wouldn't say that it's the first thing that you want to lock in as an agent, but you know, make yourself you know make, make yourself aware. Or make, make them aware of you rather, you know, and, and, and do that. But, um, you know, wait for somebody who's really passionate about you that, and look at what other acts they represent. Have they built some careers? Have they, do they just book shows and, and go for the, 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 the short term money? Or do they look at building a career? And if, if somebody looks at building a career, that's one that you want to, to go with. Can I quickly ask the panel, are there actual networks that people can plug into? When I'm doing my BBC introducing show on the Asian network, the first question usually is, is my record getting played? And once it gets played, the second question is always, do you know a good manager or a good agent? So is there an actual network or a, a proven route that most of the people here could actually walk down? Oh, I think there's, I mean, obviously there are professional organisations, but I think the fact is you do your homework a little bit. You're going to, you are going to, I mean, all of the agencies are going to be able to tell you who the personnel is, and most of those people publish the rosters. So you're going to go, well, you know, well, I'm a bit of a rock band. I maybe might be good for Russell, or I'm actually, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a great sort of, you know, I've got a great, so I'm a great sort of urban artist. Maybe I'd be better with, you know, with uh, Obi or these people. You know, it's just, 
but you can do your homework. That's not difficult. I mean, I think um, that's the first step. And I mean, uh, you know, there are directories online and available to purchase that tell you the names and addresses of every single company. You know. And what can you expect a manager to do, Martin? Do you want to? What, what's the benefit of having a manager? What would you kind of demand that they do? Or hope that they do? I, I, I guess primarily contacts, really. Uh, so very, few, very little that we sign comes straight to us. Almost everything comes through someone, as you were saying, that we trust or recommend. And managers tend to be an important part of that early network of spreading the word. Plus, obviously, as you become more successful, you want them to, to run your business properly for you. But essentially, you want your manager to be the spider in the middle of your web. And so you need a manager, bands definitely need a manager. Or you can do it yourself. I mean, we, we've worked with plenty of bands, and as, you know, our Matador label particularly, almost all of its bands are unmanaged, like Cat Power, for example, is unmanaged. Um, so labels can be quasi-managers for artists as well. So they don't have to have a manager, but it can help. I, I, it is wonderful when a huge talent comes to you without management. and and. Certainly, when, when we have the benefit of working with a fantastic manager on an artist, it's suddenly like having a turbocharger on the back of the record. It's, it's fantastic. Everything runs so smooth. Unfortunately, because management requires no qualifications whatsoever apart from a, an ability to convince the artist that you're the best person for their career, often you end up with a lot of managers that are inept and, and, and they can be a, a real problem. So. If you're going to get involved with a manager, think long and hard, because this person can in many ways be the most important person in your career. And if you're yoked to somebody that isn't working out, it can be very, very painful for you and for everybody that you're going to work with in the future. So do your research. Make sure the person that you're getting involved with on the management side is fantastic, because they need to be. Because quite often bands kind of have an old mate, don't they, that they're kind yeah. of is like the fifth member of the band, and they just go, oh, I'll look after it. And, and that doesn't work so well? Sometimes well, they're good. Sometimes that old mate can go on and be absolutely Huge brilliant. And can, managers, and in yeah. fact, An example of? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> no, put me on the spot here. <laughs> okay. We can move on I'm anyway. Gonna <laughs> I'm going to get to that. Well, Ryan, it was, I mean, Ryan it was looking after the strokes. Yeah, he wasn't exactly Ryan a mate, was but he, like, was, yeah. he was booking them at the Mercury Lounge where they were rehearsing in the basement. Yeah, he was mm. booking at the Mercury Lounge. I think, you know, with, yeah. you know, just because you're a mate of the band, doesn't mean you're going to be a bad manager or a good manager and good managers can come out of that but you know there's a, a lot to be said for actually waiting around and getting involved with somebody that's got a proven track record just like you if, if you're a new band and you sign to a talent scout or an A&R man that's never had a hit record before it doesn't mean that you can't go on and sell 20 million records because we've all had our first band Russell has I have but if you're lucky enough to get involved with somebody who's got a proven track record, the chances are you're going to go a little bit quicker. It certainly helps. I mean, it, you, you know, I mean, the fact of the matter is, like, there are some mates that end up, you know, somebody that used to load the van who then becomes the manager. But then there also are a lot of young managers out there scouting for artists, and they will be making approaches. And you have to use your wisdom to work out, as I think, as Mike says, is like, is that person providing you good value? And obviously, can they be trusted? So, you know. But there are a lot, you know, there are people out there every night and that's what they're doing. They're looking for their, their opportunity. It's been easier to find out this kind of stuff. You know, you compare it to when I was first coming through as a talent scout and I was managing bands before I was a talent scout and you had to do everything on the phone or by talking to people or going down to the local library and getting hold of books about the music industry. Now everything is at your fingertips. You can Google the person that's claiming to be a good manager and has had success and you can probably find out very quickly what everybody thinks of him, good and bad. You know, Scary. So it's, it's, it's terrifying. Um, should we have some more questions from the floor? Um, let's go over this side of the room. So go there in the blue stripy top. Should we have a matching microphone? Beautiful. And um, thanks. I was going to ask, um, what are your attitudes to university? Um, as in, is it, because I know some people say it's a great place to sort of learn new skills and build a fan base and stuff, whereas others say it's better just get out into the industry when you sort of finish school and try and get in there early on. I was wondering what you thought about that. I personally, and I know, I'm sure the live guys will tell you, a lot of the most successful promoters, agents have come from being, you know, even executives have come from being entertainment um, social secretaries at universities. I personally went to university and used that time to run nightclubs 
uh, didn't, do, didn't particularly do as well in my degree as I should have done. And when I left, I was running a nightclub full time and that led me into music business. So my own personal experience, and you have to talk about personal experience, would be a university is a good place to go because you've, you've got an audience already around you because you're in a town where there's 10, 15, 20,000 people who are of similar age, probably relatively like-minded. And if you do have a good band or your mates are in a good band, you've got, you've got, a, you've got somewhere where you know how to market to them. And if you can market to them in that environment and make them successful in that environment, then when a, a manager, an agent, a record company comes to see you, and they're impressed, i.e. the Arctic Monkeys taking 200 of the fans from Sheffield to Manchester, and everyone going, wow, there's some of the people who know the names of songs here. That is, you know, it's a micro, using, universities are microcosms, and they're really good microcosms in which to test your skills. So one day, if you get to play on the national circuit, on the global circuit, if you were good at doing it in that microcosm, maybe that was a good, a, a good part of your learning curve. Personally, that's what I found. I was in Leeds, I ran nightclubs very successfully, and you know, everyone presumed that therefore I could take my skills onto a national basis and then slightly international, and we did. And the truth of the matter is I, th I would advise anybody to try and do an academic course, I think it's always a good thing, and in the same time, if they do have a passion, carry on. There are others that leave school at 15 and go straight into working you know, somewhere in the music business, somewhere in, uh, for an agent, somewhere in the past for record shops, and that would lead them to it. But I, I'd say universities are not, are, are not a negative. You know, there is a great place to learn stuff. Everyone in agreement with that? Yeah, yeah. pretty much. I, I, I went to uh, Middlesex Poly and I never finished my course because I became the entertainment manager in the, in the student union there. And I think on a touring circuit, student unions aren't as important as they used to be. But they're still, you know, they're still great places to to, to play, and um, you know, and uh, you know, if, I mean, obviously with student loans and everything else, it's it's a lot harder to be a student now than than, than when I was. But it's it's one of the best times of your life, so you know, and it's a great way. Don't deprive yourself, you know, of, I think. Of, of meeting peers and everything. So <laughs> yeah. de definitely recommend it. Yeah. I mean, loads of great artists, didn't they? Came from you know, and bands came from meeting at universities and at college, and you know. Time, time's probably spent more in the bar than in the uh, than in the uh, in the lecture hall. But you know, either way, whatever you need to do to to acquire your life skills to succeed. Any more? Another question? Let's do another one. Okay, go down here in the hats. Not such a good hat as the girl who's sitting next to him, but we'll do anyway. <laughs> um, hi everyone. Um, there's a lot of members of bands here today. We're obviously in a place where um, a lot of great British rock has been produced. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, a recent article that says rock is dead? Should we go to George? Because George hasn't yeah. spoken much. I can see he's yeah, desperate to yeah, answer yeah, this yeah. one. Good. Rock. Um, so interesting because obviously I was, I think, on record recently or somebody twisted my words around to try and make out that I claimed that rock was dead and obviously far from it. I mean, the reality is that actually even on the Radio 1 playlist, never mind, again, just park all the specialist shows, Dan, Dan etc. We've actually put more rock on the playlist over the last two years than we probably did in the previous two years. Uh, and like the key rock managers that are around and some of the young rising rock bands that we think are the best ones around, they're all getting good support uh, you know, on the playlist at the moment over the last few years particularly. So the fact that, you know, some, I mean, I could break out rock and kind of indie if I could do that for a minute. And if you want to talk about indie alternative music, the kind of music that was, you know, all over the Radio 1 playlist three years ago, four years ago, that's not currently as in favour, there's no doubt, but it's, as explained recently, I think, to the NME, there's kind of a cycle of music in the, in the UK, and you have to kind of uh, accept that and work with that. And the point is that you create a vacuum, you fill the vacuum, and there was a vacuum for a while in that space, and loads of exciting, brilliant British guitar bands filled that vacuum, and then eventually, obviously, Radio 1 heavily supports them, heavily plays them, the audience start getting tired, but simultaneously during that period, uh, certainly British-based urban artists or black music artists were feeling like, where's the love from Radio 1? You know, they weren't selling anything. And then the cycle shifts again, and look at Tinchy, et cetera, you know, endless list. The, the cycle will shift again. It will turn again. It always does. What is everyone on the panel seeing? Is there anything that's emerging at the moment? Any, are you getting a feeling for anything that's happening? Uh, George, you know, just in terms of music that's coming towards you. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt. I mean, you know, it's been built, building up slowly but surely to an unbelievable point now. But dubstep, without any doubt at all, has got amongst the young audience that, we're, that Radio 1 is obviously particularly focusing on. 
it's getting absolutely phenomenally enormous. I mean, I met up with a guy that runs UKF Dubstep, a YouTube channel, last week. And it's the 25th biggest channel in the world on YouTube now. 40% um, of their traffic's coming from America now. So it, a British phenomenon, again, is now going global. Uh, and, you know, I, I, again, it's just like increasing numbers of artists. And you can see it if you look at what we do on the playlist, whether it's Scream, um, you know, I mean, Flux Pavilion coming up. There's a, I mean, I, can't, I won't name them all now, but I mean, there's some incredible, wild, exciting music out there. But more importantly, genuinely, there is a phenomenon that you can absolutely measure and see out there in the market that's happening in the UK, and it's huge. Okay. And it's going to get bigger again across this year. Are you seeing anything else coming through, or would you agree with what I, I, George I is saying? I think one thing comes through, and those who are slightly more learned and, and done it longer than me will tell you, quality will always come through. And always, when there's a musical genre, something will always come through that does have nothing to do with the musical genre that's the vogue of the day. And that artist will be brilliant and will come through. And I've got to say, I hear musical genres all the time. I've lived in my 20 years in the music business through a few of them. And sometimes I've got involved with them, sometimes I haven't. And I think when I saw the comments that Rock is Dead, and I know George referred to them, I sort of just semi-laughed. I remember, I remember being in, in, hearing Disco's Dead. I remember hearing Black Music's Dead. Every time you hear A Music's Dead, be aware it's coming around the corner and something's <laughs> going to hit you very quickly. And then, then there'll suddenly be an explosion and you'll be sick to death of rock music again. Or, and you'll, you know, at some point we'll get sick to death of rhythm, rhythmic urban music on the radio, which seems to be predominant at the minute. It's just cycles. You know. Mike, what are you seeing? Well, I Mediocre rock music is dead, and thank God for that. At the, the end of the 90s, I, I'm, a, I'm an enormous rock music fan, and I've been lucky enough to build my career largely working with great alternative and rock bands. And I was dismayed at the end of the 90s because the, the vast majority of music that I was hearing was rubbish. Um, but I'm, I'm hearing some good stuff at the moment, and certainly in terms of our output as a label, I sincerely hope rock music is not dead because we've got records coming from Sleigh Bells, from Vaccines, from the Foo Fighters, from Kasabian, all of which I think are going to be part of, a, of what will be a great renaissance for rock music this year. So I'm, I'm very excited. I think rock's in very robust health. But, you know, I, I think when you have a, a prevailing musical genre dominating all areas of, the, of media, as George said, you get a lot of mediocrity creeping in. And, you know, I agree, you know, dubstep is one of the most exciting things that's happened to music in a long time. You know, we work with KTB, we work with Magnetic Man. I'm thrilled that we're involved with these artists. I think they're incredible. There's an awful lot of poor quality artists in that area, and the great talented artists will come through, and the poor quality ones will hopefully fall away. What, what goes wrong is that everybody suddenly dives onto a scene, everybody signs it, and suddenly you're getting really average dubstep acts having a million pound marketing budget behind it until everyone goes, I never want to hear this again, ever. And I think that's what happened with rock music at the end of the 90s. Okay, um, Bobby. Just, just a quick point, and that, yeah. that is, I think we may have reached saturation point with dubstep. Last night I was listening to Radio 5 Live, and the current trail has the Nero track running through it. So believe me, the next big thing's just around the corner, and it may just be one of you guys who's sitting here today. Okay, um, there's another question from Billy Lockett. Is Billy here? Hey, right, I'll read your question. Um, do you feel it's harder for musicians outside of London to get noticed, and is it essential to move to London to get spotted? Jeff? Uh, I don't think it, it is essential to move to London at all, and, and probably less so now than, than ever before, I'd say. Um, you know, it, and that's one of the advantages of the internet, that you could be you know, in, sitting in Cumbria and, and you know, uploading something onto YouTube and people being aware of it. So, you know... Um, uh, you know, and you know, bands for years have. I mean, you know, look at you know, Factory Records years ago. They didn't need to to be set up in London to to exist, and uh, signed a lot of great artists, a lot of great artists who who stayed there. You know, um, so I, you know, I don't think it's always been a necessity. I think it's in, for some acts, it's made it easier because the music industry is based in London. You've got Radio One here for a start as well. You've got you know, Enemy. You've got all the agencies. So it's easier, but you know that's the advantage of email and the internet. You don't need to be be in London. So yeah, definitely, you know, you can be anywhere. Really. Martin, I think it's important to be part of a musical community and connecting with other musicians and networking with them. To that extent, if you're in a bigger city, there are going to be more of them. So if you're on your own in a Scottish island, it's probably going to be a bit tough. But other than that, I I absolutely agree with Jeff. All in agreement with that one. 
absolutely. Um, right, this is from Jacob Wheeler. Jacob, are you here? Hi, Jacob. Um, with the demise of the high street record shop and the risk of services such as Spotify, what are the panel's thoughts on the future of a songwriter or a band's income from selling music, not including live performance? Martin, do you want to go with that one again? I feel uh, clearly this is a time of, these are challenging times in that respect, but uh, these three of us here make our livings from selling recorded music. Mm. Um, and I believe that we'll continue to be able to do that. I think Spotify encourages discovery as much as it replaces sales. I think there are all kinds of new ways of purchasing coming along. Personally, I believe independent record shops are going to come back because I think they serve a function that has been neglected and there is a demand for. We're involved in the Rough Trade store in, uh, in Brick Lane, which does phenomenally well, and I can see many more of those springing up. Um, I, I, I think it will, to the extent it's gone away, I think it will come back and I think it will grow. Every creative industry has a problem right now with the internet because every creative industry has its goods taken for nothing. Mm. But everyone needs to react and develop new models which make us allow us to survive. Okay. Um, in, I mean, in terms of bands, yeah. I've I, I got to say, I think it's, we're going through a transition as a business. And as this transition will come the other side, there's always going to be a way to monetize what an artist does. That's our job as record companies, is to find ways to monetize it so we can earn a living and the artists can earn a living and publishers do the same. I don't think, there's a, I don't think that what's, we are going to, as Martin said, go through this change, but I think the other side there's going to be a new way of doing it. I don't think any of us on this panel probably know that new way, but we'll all be there ready to change our businesses to make sure that that's the way that we monetize what any artist does. But, we, but our intention, and definitely my intention, and, I'm, and I believe Sony's intention is, because I can only speak on behalf of the company I work for, is to carry on investing in artists and carry on helping them make the best music, helping them release the best music, and getting up on all these services and trying to make sure that they get as much of the money that they generate back so that everyone can make a living from it, which is what we actually, at the end of the day, is, what, is the business side of what the record company is met, or the publisher is meant to do for you. I, I mean, I, I adore record stores, you know, and be it HMV, be it Independence. You know, when I was a kid, I was buying records in John Menges and WH Smiths and Woolworths. You know, and a lot, some of those places have gone now. Some of those places don't sell records anymore. I think it's a great shame that there is this clear demise. I don't know if I'm as optimistic as um, Martin is about the future of the record store, but I sincerely hope that, that it has got a future. For us, as a business, we, we rely upon our relationship with the artists and upon the rights that we own in conjunction with the artist. And the way that we exploit those rights, either through selling records or licensing music to film and TV, or in the new deals that we're doing, earning money from the live side, from merchandise, it's all different ways that we're looking to seek revenue. We, we can't, as an industry, just rely entirely upon selling records anymore. It's still the predominant way that the record business makes its money, but we're, we're trying every other way of, of earning money because the future may involve all music being streamed to your mobile phone. I don't know, I don't think anybody knows, but it's very realistic that 10 years down the line, every TV program you want to watch, every film you want to watch, every piece of music you want to listen to, you're getting on a phone for 10 pound a month. And a lot of people might think that's fantastic. But, you know, it's interesting. I was, I was out with somebody who was working on a soup kitchen and they were dealing with a lot of homeless people and a lot of them had phones. They'd never home, they'd never anything in their lives. But the one thing they had on a, was, was a phone. And it's the same, you go to India, you go to China, you go into every crazy part of the world. If you can find a way for people to get music on their phones and find some way that tariff somehow paying money back to the songwriter, then that actually could be a better future for our business than just selling records. Okay, Bobby? Joe, we've got a question here from Twitter, which is also about revenue streams, and it's from Delta. And it says, uh, what are your views on the pay-to-play culture in the UK live music scene? Um, yeah, I've always been felt pretty opposed to that, really. I don't think you should have to, uh, I don't think you should have to uh, pay for the opportunity to uh, take your music to anybody. I, I never felt that, so. And how does that fit in with playing live becoming an alternative to selling to records as a revenue stream as well? As a way, what for who make it, who for the... Just playing live as opposed to the play-to-pay culture. 
earning so, money from playing live. Earning money from playing live. But to, I mean, it, well, it's going to be, it'll be interesting to see because I think in a, many artists had to rely on, would rely on record companies and publishers in order to sort of fund their uh, ability to be able to tour. And I think you're going to start to see, we've started to see people getting investment from all sorts of other areas and it's going to come from promoters and it's going to come from agents and it's going to come from equity companies and all sorts of people that are going to go, how can we get this going, you know? Um, I mean, there's a culture of everybody now, everybody's like saying, well, we all want a piece of this and we all want a piece of that and where everybody's trying to work out what part of the terrain uh, that they can grasp, you know? There's a, there's a huge land grab going on. but. The scale, uh, the scope of the music world is changing all the time. You know, a couple of years ago we weren't thinking about Twitter. Five years before that we weren't thinking about the influence of, of MySpace. We certainly weren't worrying about Spotify. Okay, Spotify is good. You know, it's taking music out to all sorts of people. I mean, it's a great thing. And I think as an educator, it, it is fulfilling part of that role of the local record store. But. Um, but yeah. Anyway, go, get, I suppose getting back to the point. Yeah, we're going to have to. Um, I'd like to see better funding into, into the concert circuit. Certain people have been very involved in that. Jeff's been very involved in that, in actually putting money into venues, which have been in a pretty poor state, you know? But, uh, and there's still a lot of work to be done. There's so many towns, and I bet lots of people here are gonna come from towns where like, there isn't a good venue. You know, there isn't a real venue. There isn't an academy-style venue or a good club, and I'd like to see more of that and providing more opportunities for, um, you know, for young artists to get out there. So. Okay, we're, we're running out of time now, so I'm just going to go along the panel and just ask, um, what is one bit of key advice, because that's what everybody here, I think, needs, and you've got many years under your belt um, that you can draw on and give us some advice. So, Nick, you can go first, but keep it short. Keep it short. Hard. I'm um, saying nothing. Um, the, uh, you know, for me, be ambitious, do the best you possibly can do, and try and write hit records is the way I always see it, and a hit record doesn't have to be something that is obvious, sometimes the least obvious piece of music become the most popular piece of music, and that's what pop music is, and that's how I look at it, and I'd say, believe in what you do, because if you can't believe in what you do, you can't expect anyone else to. Mike? I think it's just being passionate in all that you do and bringing that passion and that love of what you're doing out as much as possible, and work hard. And it, you know, you're, gonna, you're gonna face a lot of knockbacks, you're gonna be, it, it, it's not easy. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. You've gotta have total belief in yourself and you've gotta be persistent. So just keep at it and keep at it. Never take no for an answer. Because you know, if you really believe it in it and keep pushing, you'll get there. But you've gotta work really hard at it. George? Yeah, Mike's pretty much <laughs> copy man, I was gonna say. You've gotta, hey, you've gotta be brilliant. You've gotta be distinctive, brilliant, but don't give up. I mean, that's the thing. And I think the unique thing about the UK is because it's a relatively small pond full of people that are incredibly passionate about music. Uh, Radio One, Six Music, the BBC on top of that. But an incredible set of labels, an incredible history of music. It's not a coincidence. And I think if you are really brilliant, if you are really good, the UK is probably the best territory in the entire world to be an artist because you've got the best chance being discovered and getting somewhere. And I, and I stand by that completely. I think there's just so many people out there looking, either at radio level or at a business level, for hot new artists. It just works seamlessly. Don't give up, though. Wise words. Russell? Uh, I was thinking it's very, first and foremost, you know, get inspiration, be inspiring, listen to what everybody says, and then decide what out of any of that makes any sense to, do, to you, and then rip up the rest of it and throw it away. That's what I think. Martin? I, I think that there is no instruction manual, there is no magic formula. If there was and we knew it, we'd get it right every time, which we don't. Um, I think you just have to do what you love, and if you're brilliant, you'll get there. And Jeff? I'd echo every, every, everything everyone's said, but you've got to strive to be as the best that you can be and, and never, never try and be mediocre. Always try and you know, push yourself that bit further and because and, that will make you stand out and it's, it's standing out that's important. You need lots of perseverance, lots of passion, lots of energy, drive, enthusiasm, obviously talent, but just, you know, push yourself, go that extra mile. And, you know, when you think you've got something that's pretty good, work it again to get it brilliant. You know, just, just you know, try and get, get your very best out there. And that, that's what sets the, the best artists aside from the, from the also runs. 
Okay, I think everyone pretty much saying exactly the same thing. So hopefully that's inspired you and has given you some good advice and you're going to walk away here and be brilliant and give us a really hard time and get signed to these labels and play at these festivals and get played on the radio and uh, hopefully we'll see you all in the future. This has been the very first BBC Introducing Musicians Masterclass. Thank you so much to everybody, to all this panel, all the people who've contributed to all the different panels, all the artists who've been here as well. And uh, to you lot, thank you very much indeed for your patience. Um, take care. Good night. Good night.